One of the bravest political opponents to Venezuela's dictator is a man named Leopoldo Lopez. He's an old friend of mine. We actually went to high school together. But since those days, he has become a strong and effective opposition leader in Venezuela, which is why the Maduro regime incarcerated him on trumped up charges in retaliation for him leading nationwide civil protests. Leopoldo then spent three years in prison, much of it in solitary confinement where he was tortured. His family was persecuted into exile. So, after much international outcry, including being declared a political prisoner by Amnesty International and by the Human Rights Foundation, Leopoldo was finally released to house arrest. Two years after that, Leopoldo was able to escape when members of the military responsible for guarding him gratefully turned their back on the Maduro regime and liberated my friend. Now, Leopoldo then sought asylum at the Spanish embassy in Caracas, where he has been living under diplomatic protection. I just learned today from the media that Leopoldo has left the embassy. And while I've been recording this uh, video, we have found out that Leopoldo has made it to Spain and is reunited with his family. So congratulations to them. Here's to a better future. I had the opportunity to speak with my old high school classmate, uh, just days before his escape. And uh, I'd like to share our conversation with you. We spoke about political violence, authoritarianism, his situation, and other problems facing Venezuela today, as well as Venezuela's prospects for a democratic future. To get a clear picture as to how Leopoldo ended up in this extreme situation, we have to start by discussing Chavez. Until the election of Lieutenant Colonel Hugo Chavez in 1998, Venezuela was among the most vibrant and stable democracies with the strongest middle class in all of Latin America. Chavez ushered in populist policies and ideals, including the implementation of social welfare programs funded by the windfall profits from the oil industry as oil prices rose. Great, but... Chavez's policies and style in practice led to economic mismanagement, complete destruction of uh, private industry, and the erosion of democratic institutions. During his time in power, Chavez curtailed free expression and oversaw the passage of a new constitution that eliminated checks and balances as well as term limits on the presidency. Chavez packed the Supreme Court, he militarized the government, he destroyed or brought out the independent press, and began jailing opposition leaders. His government brought the highest level of corruption in the world. The price and currency controls, overspending, and dependence on a single commodity made the economic model absolutely unsustainable. Shortly after the rigged elections that gave him a fourth term in 2012, Chavez died of cancer, and his hand-picked successor, Nicolás Maduro, assumed the presidency. Under Maduro, Venezuela's decline into authoritarianism and economic ruin accelerated. By 2014, Venezuela had entered a recession and is now in the worst peacetime economic crisis the entire world has seen in decades. The GDP of the country contracted by 70% in just the last few years. Poverty, violence, starvation, and shortages of crucial supplies are now normal. By 2017, almost three quarters of the population had lost an average of almost 20 pounds, with emergency rooms overwhelmed by cases of severely malnourished children and citizens scavenging food from trash dumps all around the city. By 2019, 94% of Venezuelans lived in poverty. Access to clean water and electricity is highly limited. Hospitals lack the equipment they need to even function. And shortages of medicine mean hundreds of thousands of people are unnecessarily at risk or dying without access to treatments for diseases like cancer, HIV, diabetes, preventable diseases like diphtheria, malaria, measles, and tuberculosis are rampant, as are rare diseases like the yellow fever. 
the rates of infant and maternal mortality have soared. Unemployment rates are staggering high with a forecast of 50% for this year, the highest in the world. The average nurse or teacher in Venezuela earns less than $5 per month. Violent crime, especially murder, has become rampant with Venezuela's crime rate in the top three in the world. More than 4 million people, 15% of the population, has left their country in just the last five years. The scale of ongoing and humanitarian catastrophe is really, it's almost unfathomable. And yet Maduro and his regime have responded to all this by denying that there are any problems and violently repressing anyone who disagrees. The Special Action Forces, which is an elite police unit, are responsible for thousands of extrajudicial killings, as well as the torture and arbitrary disappearances. Food aid and access to health care is entirely contingent on political loyalty to Maduro, with the regime providing humanitarian relief only to individuals who are proven to be supporters of his government. In May of 2018, another sham election was held and Maduro claimed victory. The democratically elected National Assembly declared his presidency to be illegitimate and appointed Juan Guaido as acting president. Pursuant to the Constitution, Maduro refuses to yield power, triggering an ongoing constitutional crisis with close to 60 countries, including most of the Americas and Europe, formally recognizing Guaido as the legitimate constitutional president of Venezuela. I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's very exciting to get to see you uh, again. It's been a long, long time. And um, you've been through a lot. It's been a, a long trip, uh, many years since, uh, well, since we worked together at, at the home school in, in 1988. Uh, you graduated that year. I graduated the year after that. And uh, after that, I stayed for a while in the U.S. I went out to college and then I did my master's in the U.S., came back to Venezuela. Uh, I became mayor for eight years of my city, and uh, that was a fantastic experience. Uh, but throughout the whole time, since the uh, year 2000, we've been fighting against a, a, a regime that has become more and more rude and cruel uh, over the years. In 2013, we, we started a movement to confront the dictatorship directly. We, we decided that we needed to take a stand, very clear. We were not analysts. And uh, we, we, we had several meetings. And our question was, are we in a dictatorship or we are in a democracy? And our conclusion was that we were in a, in a dictatorship. Uh, the world at that time was still calling Venezuela uh, a democratic experiment. And many people fell for that. Many people were fooled that this was a, a new way of understanding democracy and, and, and and the idea of helping the, the needed. Uh, but unfortunately, what was unfolding was a, a very um, strong dictatorship. So in, uh, in 2014, we decided to take a stance and uh, we trained ourselves all over Venezuela uh, in a movement of nonviolence. Uh, so we took the streets and we took the streets um, massively all over Venezuela. Tens of thousands of people came out uh, with a cry of freedom and, uh, and for regime change. And uh, at that moment, I was uh, taken into prison. Uh, since 2014, February of 2014, I was taken to a military prison. I stayed there almost four years. Uh, after that, they took me to house imprisonment. I stayed there around a year. And I've been here uh, in the Spanish embassy uh, as a host of the Spanish embassy. but. Uh, in confinement without having the possibility of going out of the embassy for a year and a half now. So, so that's a, a short uh, cut of uh, this long trip of uh, the last 20 or so years. How are you doing inside your head? Very well, very well. You know, um, that, that's a good question. And uh, it, it, the first moment I got into prison, I knew that the battleground of my fight for freedom, which is the fight of millions of Venezuela, uh, took a, a different uh, field. I used to be in the streets. I used to go all over Venezuela. I used to 
uh, do I, I, I like politics uh, in terms of being very close to the people, but I knew things were going to change. So I knew that the, that the battleground was in my head. So I decided that I needed to do something uh, in order to, um, to confront what was coming. So I designed a method that took three basic things. I needed to take care of my head, I needed to take care of my body, and I needed to take care of my spirit. So I developed uh, a routine, which is something that many prisoners talk about when they're in prison. You need to, you need to develop a, a, a disciplined routine that makes every day a conquest. So every day you gain something. So every day I, I exercised in my small two by two cell. Uh, every day I tried to read when I had books. And, uh, and every day I prayed and I prayed a lot. And it was a, a very spiritual uh, experience. You know, it was tough. Prison is very tough, but uh, I don't have resentment uh, and I don't have hatred. And I think it has a lot to do with the way I took um, this, uh, this process uh, that is, you know, in the head. And, and, and it's all in the head. Uh, I have seen many people go through prison. Many of my friends, many of our colleagues uh, have gone to, through prison. My own political party has had over 500 detainees, over 100 uh, political prisoners. There has been over 5,000 detentions of political prisoners in Venezuela as a whole. Uh, some people come out of prison stronger, uh, some people don't. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to go through a process of, of that sort. I can't imagine how difficult it is for you. What does the path to freedom look like for you? What's, what's the best avenue for change for Venezuela and for you? Well, it's, it's, it's about freedom, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, we, there is a, a, a discussion taking place uh, about what, what type of democracy do we want. But in Venezuela, before we go into that discussion of what type of democracy, uh, which is something that we've thought a lot about, and we have ideas about that, and we have uh, a view of what should happen in Venezuela, there is a first requirement, which is freedom. Uh, without freedom, we cannot dream of anything else. So in a way, we are blessed, Ethan, that we have a commitment to a cause. And, and, and that's, in my view, and we always talk about this, that's a blessing. Uh, it's not a blessing to be uh, comfortable. It's not a blessing to, to, um, to be happy in, in the way most people think of happiness. But it's a blessing to live with a commitment, to live with a cause. And, uh, and that is something that makes us be very idealistic. The other day, I was talking to... A European, um, uh, a, a European bureaucrat that was talking to us about Venezuela. And he said, well, you seem to me that you're very idealistic and not too possibilistic. And I said, well, my friend, my job is to be idealistic precisely. You know, that's what this is about. If you don't have the idea, you don't follow through. If you don't have the idea, you don't commit to it. Uh, so this is about uh, having the, the assurance that we will overcome. And, and there will be change in Venezuela. There will be freedom in Venezuela. I have no doubt of that. I cannot tell you if that's going to happen in a week, in a month, in a year, in two years. But I can assure you that uh, we will continue to fight. And I, and I talk in a we in a very plural way because we're talking about thousands of people who are committed to this fight for freedom. You know, I spent a lot of time filming a movie in, in South Africa and, you know, read The Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela's journey and his struggle with imprisonment and his struggle for his people to reach freedom. And I, I, I can imagine that you could find some inspiration there or, or hope. I, I really know what you mean that the, the, the truth is being comfortable is not really a blessing. The only way history changes is by people who are being hurt to speak up and, and, and speak out. And the powers that be never want and they don't like light and communication. They like the status quo and greed and fear are, are very powerful obstacles. Did you read The Long Walk to Freedom? Have you read that one? No, absolutely. I've read it twice. I've seen the movie. Uh, of course, I'm a follower of Nelson Mandela. He's a, he's a true inspiration. And uh, for, in many ways, you know, in many ways. And, and, and you, you read about and you think about people like Nelson Mandela or, or Martin Luther King, whom, who's one of my, my, my great um, leaders, idols, people that... Uh, that I follow, that have shaped my ideas, and, and many others, uh, that people that have been in prison, and, and you get to understand uh, the commonalities uh, mm -hmm. of that struggle of being in solitary confinement, of fighting for your ideas when you don't have liberty. 
You know, Ethan, uh, freedom is a, it's an abstract idea for many people. Freedom, democracy, those are uh, abstract ideas. And, and I think people that live in the in functioning democracies think of these things the same way we think about oxygen. We are breathing right now, but we don't think about it. Uh, in, in a way, many people uh, take freedom for granted and take uh, democracy for granted. And I learned what freedom was about in a solitary confinement, in a cell two by two, with a huge lock the size of a, a brick. That's when I learned what freedom was about. Uh, that's because I knew what I wanted. I knew what was my hope, uh, not for me, but also for Venezuela. Uh, so uh, the experience of Mandela uh, taught, uh, taught me a lot uh, about how to go through prison and, and how to think about very important things. Uh, resentment, for example, hatred, for example. Um, I came out of jail uh, to my house arrest, so I had the possibility of, of uh, communicating with people. And some of the first people that I communicated with, uh, in order to bring them on to or fight for freedom, were the people that prosecuted me, that asked for 14 years of prison, uh, people that went against our political party and detained and, and uh, were responsible for some of the things that happened to us. But at that moment, uh, almost four years after that happened, they were in the right side of, of history, in the right side of our fight. Uh, so we built bridges. Uh, and that's one of the things you learn from people like Mandela, that it's about looking forward. It's not about resentment, because there will always be excuses. There will always be excuses to say this person or this group or this circumstance did this to me and to the ones I love or to the people that are close to me. Uh, and we are about uh, doing justice. Yes, it's about doing justice, uh, but it's not about resentment. It's not about revenge. It's about fixing our country and making our country uh, a place where people can dream and, and, and fight and work for their dreams. And that's not the country we have now in Venezuela. Well, why don't you tell me a little bit about where, where Venezuela is at right now? Like I have this question here that in the published findings at, on September 16th, the Independent International Fact Finding Mission on Venezuela published a report documenting evidence of unlawful executions, enforced disappearances, arbitrary detentions, rape, torture since uh, 2014, and the UN report is pretty devastating. Among other things, the report recommends that the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court takes into account the victim's needs to have justice served in a timely fashion. I mean, tell me about what do you think the chances are to that happen, and maybe tell people watching this a little about, about the state of Venezuela right now. What does it really look like from your point of view? Well, I, I can tell you very briefly where we come from. Venezuela uh, is one of the potentially richest countries in the continent. Venezuela has the largest amount of oil reserves in the country. Same with natural gas. And we have all sorts of uh, opportunities to, to be a, a prosperous uh, country. But unfortunately, the country has taken a very different uh, way of development towards undevelopment and towards repression and dictatorship. So now, we are one of the poorest countries in the continent, without a doubt, uh, only uh, compared with Haiti. Venezuela, over the past years, have witnessed the largest exodus in the history of the American continent. Today, the exodus of Venezuela, the forced migration, is only equal to that that has happened, to the one that has happened in Syria. So uh, that gives you an idea. Of, of what is happening in terms of, of the people and their views for the future in Venezuela. But unfortunately, what we are seeing is that uh, poverty rate in Venezuela has increased up to 90%, and extreme poverty over 50%, malnourishment, that is that, that kids don't have a way of feeding themselves three times a day. It's more than two thirds of the children in Venezuela. And this is in a country, as I said before, that is potentially rich. So Venezuela today is going through a very devastating situation socially. We are, as the UN expresses about Venezuela, we are undergoing a complex humanitarian crisis. Uh, that is that this is a multi-layer humanitarian crisis, that it touches everything, healthcare system, water supply, uh, food supply, uh, and of course human rights. And that report that you're referring to is a recent report made by the, by the UN uh, that states how the dictatorship over the past six years has become a machine of repression, destruction, rape, 
violence and homicides. Uh, more than 3,000 people have been accounted for uh, to have been victims of, directly of, uh, of the repression machine of, of Nicolás Maduro. For example, Pipo Rada. Pipo is a friend. He lives in a, in a, in a uh, sector of Caracas, my city, in a poor sector of Caracas called Petare. He became a, a part of the city council, a very strong leader, uh, very committed to our cause. He was one of the five people that were with me the day I presented myself to the authorities right before they took me into a helicopter. Uh, a year ago, next week, uh, he was um, abducted, then he was tortured, then he was shot in the back of his head with two shots, and then he was taken outside uh, in front of his family's house and he was burned. And they put a cloth in his face so uh, we could see that it was him. And that's one case uh, of, of political violence in Venezuela. But uh, cases of uh, congressmen that has, have been uh, elected by the people, members of the National Assembly, they have been taken into imprisonment, like Gilbert Caro, for example, or Renzo Prieto. Uh, and they spent months uh, in a very small cell tied with handcuffs to, to a bed, to a, uh, to a, to a lock. Uh, and this is happening to a congressman. And to regular people, there are registrations of more than 7,000 direct homicides by the authorities. They come into, especially the poorest sectors of, of Venezuela, uh, and then they kill uh, whoever is there. Um, sometimes they kill the person that they're looking for, but many times they kill innocent people. So that's a type of that's the type of regime that we are facing: a very violent, a very repressive, a, a very um, uh, a, a, a regime that does not uh, take into consideration by any means the human rights of, of the Venezuelan people. Uh, and, and on top of that, unfortunately for the Venezuelan people, um, this is not a model of the left or the right or, or no, no, this is a criminal machine that has taken over the state of Venezuela, uh, that have links with all sorts of criminal organizations all over the world. Drug trafficking has become uh, one of the main economic activities in Venezuela. Uh, illegal gold exploitation that has taken uh, a huge toll on the Venezuelan environment and on the most beautiful landscapes, not only of Venezuela, but of the world. For, you know, Angel Falls, you've seen uh, Angel Falls, is the tallest fall in the world. It's here in Venezuela. It's part of a, a national park. Well, right in that national park, at this moment, there is massive gold and diamond exploitation that is uh, taking a toll that will never come back. Uh, so, now, and I can go on and on of yeah. uh, of this repression well, and criminal machine that is governing in Venezuela. I remember there was a time period when everybody was really excited about Venezuela. You would hear about Chavez, and you he was kind of the the light. What, what happened? Why did it go so wrong? Well, you know, it, it has a lot to do with um, with the fact that we were a rich uh, oil country. Uh, Chavez came in in a moment uh, where there, the Venezuelan people wanted change. Uh, and uh, at that moment when he came into power, Venezuela had the largest opportunity to develop our country. More than one million million dollars came into Venezuela. That is one plus 12 zeros. That's the amount of dollars that came into Venezuela in the period of 20, uh, uh, 20 yeah, the 2000. Uh, up until uh, 2016. And all those funds, uh, or not all, most of those funds were evaporated in corruption and in mismanagement. But it also created uh, a, some of, a sense of prosperity. Uh, and there was the idea at some moment that this was a new model of democracy. They spoke a lot about the people, the poor people, about the rights of the people. They had a narrative that was attractive at a moment where people, not only in Venezuela, not only in the continent, but around the world, were looking for different models. And Venezuela uh, was something to follow as, as, a, as a possibility. Unfortunately, we knew, Ethan, for, from the very beginning, where we were going. And it was very difficult for us to send our message outside Venezuela. And I'll give you an example. When I was taken into prison, my wife, Lillian, who became my voice for, for many years, 
Um, she went all over the world and all over Venezuela. And the first meetings that she had in, in early 2014, she would meet with uh, bureaucrats of, of embassies and organizations, but they wouldn't even receive her uh, or meet with her in their offices. They met with her in cafes outside, uh, and they wouldn't even give her the, their personal cards. They would write their numbers in, uh, in a napkin. Uh, and that started to change. She became very uh, dedicated to talk about what was happening in Venezuela, the human crisis, the social crisis. And, and in the end, she presented the case of Venezuela to many people, presidents all over the continent, all over the world. Uh, and the case of Venezuela, because of the deterioration that was happening in all sectors, started to be on the spotlight again for change. In 2014, when we called for nonviolent uh, movement and massive protests, nonviolent protests took place, uh, Venezuela was in the spotlight. Uh, the protests went on for six months. Uh, and then in 2017, again, a cycle of protests that were very um, disciplined by the protesters, but very aggressive and repressive by the dictatorship. Uh, and that put Venezuela again uh, in the spotlight. So we have been in, in the spotlight at moments where change has been close to happen. And, and I think that moment again should come because um, the situation that we are living is, is just, uh, in, it, this, is, this is a moment where uh, we need to really make a huge effort to bring faith on people uh, that change will come about. How? Because what's, what's the it, way, what's the path forward? Well, the path forward, it's always with the people to start with, always organizing the people, always calling to be in touch with the people, the people needs. And uh, I'll give you an anecdote of just last week. Last week, uh, a cycle of protests started in Venezuela in very poor uh, towns uh, that used to be very aligned with, the, uh, with the, the political party of the dictatorship. And they, they came out, thousands of people came out and they were crying, we are hungry, we want freedom. We are hungry, we want freedom. So my, my point in this is that people know that in order to feed themselves, in order to have any sort of solution, uh, they, we need to have as a country, we need freedom. So uh, how, to go for, how to go forward? Organizing the people, organizing the people in many ways. Um, Nonviolent protest is a way of doing it. Uh, organizing people politically is another way of doing it. Uh, getting the message passed um, of what is happening in Venezuela is another way of doing it. In Venezuela, there is no free media, Ethan. No free media at all. Uh, there is no way to pass a message of change uh, that will be seen by, by the people in the TV or in radio. So we need uh, the people and social media as uh, the only way to, to pass a message. You ask us how we want to do this. Free and fair elections. Free and fair elections. Pretty simple. Long walk to freedom, my friend. Long walk to freedom. You yep. remember that moment when Mandela describes that there was violence and he took the risk and he told the, the South African people, he said, you might not like what I am going to say, but I am going to say what I need to say. And the only way to go forward and to bring about change is that you vote. And I call you to go out and vote. We are in a moment previous to that speech of Mandela because we don't even have the possibility now to have a free and fair election for, a, for the presidential and parliamentary and any other election. So we're fight now and what we call the entire world to look at Venezuela and to help us is to pressure uh, by all means to have a free and fair election in Venezuela that will bring about change, presidential election, because it's the only way that, that true change uh, could happen in our country. Where you are now, do you get to see your wife? Well, no, no. My, uh, I have not seen my father in, in six years, my mother in two and a half years, and I've not seen my wife and kids in a year and, and six months. And all half. right, well, listen, here's, here's, here's the thing. is like, all right, so I'm going to pray for you every day, okay? And I'm going to be with you in here. I'm reading this book right now, and it's it's very interesting. You might have already read it. Do you know about Joe Hill, the organizer? He's an early union organizer. He was a musician, but he spoke for people's rights, and, and he's, he's little known anymore. But I'm finding the book very interesting, and I think it would speak to you. And I've done some writing in the past, you know, uh, 
a, a little journalistic writing in my life. And I know some people in some magazines. And because that we used to know each other, we have such an interesting, uh, unique, we've, we've, we've gone such different paths that I, I'd be interested in maybe this not being our only interview. And maybe we could do a little project together so I could get this story out a little bit more. I could take the idea you know, to a couple different magazines and a couple different outlets. Would that be interest? Would that be? No, no, no. That that would be that would be that would be great. Uh, I would be honored <laughs> to do that. Well, you know, I I have been. Uh, this is the first time that I'm doing an interview <laughs> in 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 many years um, because I'm forbidden uh, to communicate. Uh, but in 2018, I did a a long interview that took like three months with the New York Times Magazine, uh, and, and the article came out in March of, uh, of 2018. Uh, and it was interesting because it was, uh, and, and it speaks to what you're saying, to have a project where we can, we can have uh, uh, ongoing conversation about you know, different ideas and also about what is happening here, because we are in the middle of a country that is crumbling. We, uh, more than half of the population, as we speak, don't have electricity right now. Uh, more than three thirds of the population don't have um, uh, running water. The entire country, as we speak, does not have gasoline in a country that has the largest reserves of oil in the planet. And we have the capacity to refine 1.7 million barrels of gasoline per day. And we don't have gasoline in Venezuela. So that speaks to the collapse that we are facing. So yes, I mean, I, and I it's, it, your your lack of your lack of gasoline. I'm imagining doesn't have anything to do with environmental protection. No, no, unfortunately, unfortunately, and I think you know, I think um, the, the, what's what's happening with the environment here in Venezuela is something that uh, that could be interesting to see if you find other people that uh, that would like to look into what is happening because this is one of. The, the largest ecocides that is happening in the planet right now. I mean, and, and the process of devastation of the most beautiful land in, in Venezuela, and maybe uh, one of the most beautiful in the world, uh, is being destroyed. So there are many different facets of, of what, is, uh, what is happening in Venezuela that we can talk. Many people talk about Venezuela and, and uh, about the, the, the negative and, and what is happening. And yes, I mean, all this is a tragedy and, and it's terrible what is happening. But we need to put a note of hope. Uh, we need to put, we need to talk about the possibility of freedom, hope, progress, and, and, and the well-being of the Venezuelan people. This is a call for activism. This is a call to take a stand. This is a call to speak up. This is a call, a call for, to fight for freedom, to fight for what you believe. And, and as I said before, if you do that, uh, in, in a way, it's a blessing because you bring a cause to your everyday life. And that is, uh, that is something that we want the world to hear, that we need the help of the world. We need people to understand what is happening in Venezuela. I think you might find, I have the secret hope right now that you might find an ear in America, in the United States. We're, we're watching a criminal element take over our government. And we can, see, I think this country can see how it's happening. And uh, I think they might have an open ear to your situation. And I, I think it's gonna be very interesting the, the pivot the United States makes in the coming election. I, I can't imagine that the Trump administration has been helpful, but maybe they have. Well, to, to, to be very honest, uh, they have taken the case of Venezuela um, very seriously and they have been very, very active. And- uh, Well, that's good. Truthful to, to the fact that they have been uh, putting a lot of pressure uh, to the dictatorship. But the case of Venezuela has gone beyond uh, the party lines. It's one of maybe three issues in Washington that is bipartisan. Maybe it's the only one. In February of this year, Juan Guaido, who is uh, the interim president recognized by uh, 60 countries in the world, he went to Washington, D.C., and he was invited to the State of the Union. And he received there a standing ovation of Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the very, very few episodes where you see uh, party lines being erased for a common cause. Uh, and and that's, that, that's our fight. I mean, we, want, we need Europe, we need the US, we need the region, we need Colombia, we need Brazil, we need you know, every person, every government, every organization uh, to help us because this is about the suffering of more than 30 million people inside and outside Venezuelans because we are 
27 here and uh, thir and five that have fled uh, Venezuela, but are not necessarily living uh, with good standards. Maybe there's a way that you and I can have a longer conversation and I can get a little more educated about your situation and what are some steps that we, how we could invite other people to get involved that, that makes sense so we could continue this dialogue. No, for sure, for sure. And I'll send you, let, let's get in touch and I'll, I'll be sending you information that I'll find uh, important for you to read. Because I have a, a show coming out that I've been working hard on for four years and it's about John Brown who fought for racial justice in the United States. You know, I mean, he, he was hung and his, his position was a very strong position that human equality for everyone. And that as soon as you turn your eye away from the dispossessed and the poor, that you just lost the plot, you know? Uh, that we're we're here to take care of each other, and uh, you know, there's a, a great quote I read the other day. It's from a woman, Margaret Mead, who said that um, the first act of civilization was the first time somebody helped heal somebody else's femur. The first time they learned to do, it. and she just used it as a as a meditation on that's what we're here to do is heal one another. You know, there's yeah. really nothing else to do, and and uh, I, I can't tell you, it does my heart really good to to look in your eyes, albeit through the internet, but to see you and hear you, um, see you, too. You, you know. Uh, no, Ethan, it's, uh, it's, it's as, as you say, it's been a, a, a strange uh, and, and a long walk to freedom, not freedom yet, but it's been a long walk, it's been a strange trip, uh, but I've been following you for all these years, you know, since the Dead Poet Society, and, and I really congratulate you, and, and every time you, you, t you take a, a movie out, I always go out and do a, the best of my effort to see it. I'll say, hey, that's my friend. I know Ethan. And some people well, don't believe me. You know, some people, you know, some people say, no, you're exaggerating. I said, no, no, we went. To well, now you can send them this. You, you'll send them this interview. I'm going to try to get us both hired to do a big profile on you. I'll try to figure out the biggest uh, platform I can to maybe write about you. And we'll get your story out there and the story of your people and the cause that you're fighting for. All right. Oh, excellent, excellent. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be honored to do that. And you know, even what you're talking about about Brown, and, and you, you can find so many people uh, that are examples of this, of of fighting for a cause and, and being comfortable in in the adversity. Uh, when I was in prison, I in 2015, there was a possibility of parliamentary elections, but the regime was not calling for the elections, so we decided to go for a hunger strike. Uh, and we went in a hunger strike for 28 days. More than 100 prisoners in other prisons, all political prisoners went to that hunger strike, and more than 300 people followed us in that hunger strike uh, outside prisons. And uh, throughout those 28 days, uh, of course I was hungry, of course it was difficult, but I was always engaged with this idea that we will overcome, we will make it happen. And after 28 days, they called for the election. And I, I'm, I give you this as an example of in the most adverse moments, you can be very optimistic with what you are fighting for. And you need to learn to fall and step back up again and continue. And the only way to continue is to have a very strong belief that what you are doing is right, that what you are doing is worth it that what you are doing is what you need to do uh, at that moment in time. And I'm, as I said before, I, I, I feel a, a blessing that we are in, in a moment where we can fight uh, for the well-being of millions of people. And we might make mistakes, like any human, uh, but I can tell you that our decisions have always been uh, aligned to that idea, change and freedom for the Venezuelan people. Will you take care of yourself? And I'm going to pray for you every day because uh, you, I'm so I'm so honored to be speaking to you. Me too. Me too. It's a great honor to, to be all speaking right. with you and to see that we are going to do things in the future. Let's keep it going. All right. This is a beginning, yes, my friend. Power get, to the people. I'll get your beautiful face out there. Okay. Yes, we will do so. <laughs> okay, man. All right. Peace.